After you finish making your video or screencast, you'll want to share it with people. Now where and how you share it will depend upon your purposes for it. For example, if you want to share it primarily with your students, then you might simply put a link to it on your web page for your course, and the video itself would reside on a server that is run by your university or your institution. On the other hand, if you want to absolutely make sure that only your students have access to the video, then you may want to put it inside your course management system. Personally, I think that knowledge should be shared with everyone, and so I would suggest that whenever possible, whatever content you make, you make available to a wide variety of audience. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that, and I'm going to explore those. First of all, you could simply upload your content, your video file that is, to YouTube. Now it's true that most of the content, most of the videos on YouTube are of no real value, no educational value. However, there are so many videos on YouTube that even if only a tiny percentage of them are of educational value, then I think it's worth looking into. For example, I've found hundreds of videos that I've asked my students to view and make use of, and also my, my own children as well. Uh, here, for example, is, is one of my favorites that I've shown with my children. It's about the relative sizes of things in the universe. I'm just going to show you uh, the first uh, 10 or 15 seconds of it. And the video goes on from there through our solar system and then beyond through our galaxy. And it's a highly effective video in giving students a sense of how big or how small various things in the universe are. And personally too, I've found lots of resources on YouTube that have been very helpful with studying other languages. So I don't want to overlook YouTube as a potential effective repository for video content that you create. Especially important is the fact that YouTube has created a kind of subdivision called YouTube EDU, standing for YouTube Education. It's also known as YouTube University. And dozens or probably hundreds now of universities around the world have taken advantage of this by creating their own channels on YouTube. The University of Waterloo, for example, has created a channel on YouTube and we use it to highlight special events such as the visit by Bill Gates to our university and we also use it to share the content of workshops and seminars with our faculty, staff and students. Here, for example, is a workshop on data visualization tools that I created a few months ago, and I turned it into a screencast. Many other universities are even using their YouTube University channel in order to disseminate entire courses to their students. Here, for example, is Stanford University, and I have keyed up one of their engineering courses. I'll just play a little bit of it so you get a sense of it. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development. Okay, good morning. Uh, welcome to CS229, the machine learning class. So, what I want to do today is just go over, spend a lot of time going over the logistics of the class and then... So you get a sense of, of what is happening there. It's an entire course which has been recorded and subsequently distributed or disseminated over the Stanford University YouTube channel. There are a couple of nice things about having a university YouTube channel. One is that the content from the various departments or faculties 
at the university are pulled together into a single place. You could, for example, have every individual instructor creating his or her own YouTube channel, but that kind of fragmentation would mean that it would be kind of hard for, for students to, to find the resources. So having a YouTube channel pulls everything together. The other main advantage is that if you have a YouTube University channel, your videos can be of well, pretty much unlimited length. You can have videos of, of at least an hour or more, whereas if you are using the regular YouTube account, your videos are limited to, I believe, 15 minutes in length. Of course, there's also alternatives to YouTube. Vimeo, for example, is another repository for video content. Works the same way as YouTube. You can easily upload content and then others can view and share it. I should mention as well Google Videos, which is not a repository for your video content. In other words, you can't upload your video files there in the way that you can with YouTube or Vimeo. However, Google Videos does search the web for videos, and so this is a good place to find content that exists elsewhere on the web. So for example, if I do a search for something like mitosis, a term from biology, it will find all of the videos that have to do with that process. Uh, here in fact the, the top one is one from YouTube. Mitosis begins as the even though we found it via Google Video. Let's move on to another way that you can distribute your video content and that is through iTunes. Now you probably know of iTunes primarily or at least originally as a music service. However, iTunes now has much more content on it than just music. You can get movies, TV shows, podcasts, audiobooks, screencasts, and much more through the iTunes service. For example, I am going to search for mitosis again, and we'll see that we can, there's a book, an audiobook called mitosis, but also within iTunes U, there is a audio podcast. Welcome to Mitosis, an Am I Learning podcast for iTunes U for Mackle by Valerie Levier. Before we jump right into Mitosis, let's have a quick review of the cell cycle. And that is from Michigan's MI Learning Division. And there are also some screencasts that are available that are about mitosis. and so on. Now iTunes is different from YouTube in that you don't actually upload your content to the iTunes server. Instead your content has to exist elsewhere on the web, for example on your own university's website or on a WordPress blog. But what iTunes does do is that it will take that file information, your video file information, once it is wrapped in what is called an RSS feed and it will then syndicate or distribute it so that your users, your students perhaps, are able to subscribe to your podcast, whether it's an audio podcast or a video podcast, through iTunes. The advantage of using iTunes is that once students subscribe to your podcast initially, then every time you create a new episode within that podcast, that episode is sent to their media device automatically. They don't have to do anything else. It simply appears in the same way that a magazine that you might subscribe to appears every week automatically in your mailbox. Here's an example of an entire course that has been made available through iTunes. Physics 1 Classical Mechanics from MIT. I want to show you one other resource and it's called the Khan Academy. And the Khan Academy is an organization that has made about, well, over, over 2,000 mini lectures or mini tutorials on subjects in physics, chemistry, finance, economics, and they're available free of charge to anyone who has access to the internet. One of the effective things about the Khan Academy's approach is that each 
segment, each video segment, is about 10 minutes long and focuses on a particular aspect of a subject. And this means that individual segments, individual tutorials, can be pulled in and put in different orders. It's like each one is a building block and they can be put in different configurations by an instructor. Or, from a student's perspective, if he or she is having trouble with a specific aspect of a course, then he or she can find within the Khan Academy's materials something that will help them get over that learning challenge. I'll just very quickly show you the catalog or library of videos that are available. They're broken down into disciplines such as algebra, arithmetic, biology, banking and money, calculus, further down, developmental math, current economics, and so on. I'm just choosing one at random. Simplify negative one times this expression in brackets, and so on. In any event, the Khan Academy is a fairly new venture, but I do think that it has potential to, to transform how education happens or will happen in the future. Perhaps not this particular venture, but ones like it. All of which belong to a kind of ideological movement called open learning. So, in short, once you create video content, or audio content for that matter, it might be a, an audio podcast or a video podcast, but once you create it, you obviously need to share that with, with others, with your students in particular. You can just put that on your university's own server and then link to it from your course web page. You could also put it within your course management system so that only your students have access to it, or you could put it on any number of more public repositories such as YouTube or YouTube University. Your university could, for example, or perhaps already has, set up a YouTube University channel. There are also alternatives to YouTube such as Vimeo, and you could also use something like iTunes in order to help to disseminate that video content or audio content to your students. Mm -hmm. So you would essentially create an RSS feed so that every time you create a new episode within your podcast, your students would automatically be alerted to the existence of that new episode and would download it into their media player and listen to it and learn from it. And then finally, I think it'll be important to watch what happens with ventures such as the Khan Academy and the open learning ideology that such ventures are founded upon. I do think that open learning, the assumption in other words, that learning education should be available to all free of charge, I do think that that is going to be a growing phenomenon. We've seen that with MIT and its open courseware, for example and it will be interesting to see where these things go in the future.